process of, of discovery is an ongoing condition of the human experience. And I think that it's easy to lose sight of that in this modern day and age when we have all this amazing technology and you know, mobile phones and all that kind of stuff, computers. Um, but there's really a lot that we don't know about the, the real workings, the gears and things of our, of our world and our universe. And so I think you know, we have to keep that in perspective that there are absolutely things beyond our can, our, our realm of understanding out there. And, you know, I think if people are just open-minded enough to accept that, that, you know, we don't know everything and that, you know, there are, there are experiences still that we can learn from and, you know, gain knowledge about. Greetings and welcome to The Vortex. I'm your host, Daniel Jones, and I'm glad to be joined by my good friend and cryptozoologist, Ken Gerhardt. Always a pleasure, Daniel. So it's great to have you here at the Edinburgh Out of This World UFO Conference, where we're talking about a very mysterious subject, aerial phenomenon, unexplained mm. things up there in the sky. Yep. And while a lot of people think about flying saucers and spaceships and things like that, you've written about flying humanoids mm -hmm. and encounters with these creatures or beings, whatever they are, that people are experiencing all over the place. And you wouldn't think about UFOs as being these people up in the sky, whatever these yeah. things are flying around. So people think about flying saucers, spaceships, and things like Objects. that. Objects, yeah. not, not living things. <laughs> yeah, so what has your experience been like getting into this research and then coming across a lot of these interesting cases? Well, first of all, I have to make a distinction because you know cryptozoology is typically related to you know zoology, so you know, animals. And in terms of these flying humanoids, you know, you've got things like the Mothman, very famous, and uh, some of the other creatures have been reported. They don't really fit into that paradigm of the natural world. People describe things that are, you know, basically human-like with wings. I mean, that, there's nothing in the fossil history, there's nothing that would indicate that something like that could have evolved naturally. Moreover, a lot of these cases, such as the Mothman, and there's you know, England has something called the Owl Man, and you have the Bat Squatch, and all these kind of different variations. Um, they, they all, all of these cases um, contain really elements of just high strangeness. Um, you know, for example, in terms of like the Mothman, you had a lot of UFO sightings that were going on around that time period when most of the sightings happened in the 1960s. You had the men in black, you know, visitations from these intimidating, weird humanoid beings. Um, some of the Mothman witnesses claimed that they developed psychic powers and that they had poltergeist activity that happened at their, you know, so just all of these little elements of strangeness. So, you know, in terms of my flying humanoid research, of course, I've always been interested in the Mothman. And one of the theories is that maybe people were just seeing a big bird, like a thunderbird or something. Um, my mother was really instrumental in getting me interested in Mothman at a young age. She used to talk about it a lot. But um, in 2015, this, uh, my publisher, Llewellyn, had a suggestion. They said, why don't you write a book about flying humanoids? You know, and, and not just the Mothman, but like the worldwide phenomenon. So, so that, that was kind of the inspiration for the book, was looking at it, you know, globally. Yeah. So this is something that... We see a lot in modern times, but we might find traces going back into our ancient past where you see depictions of these winged figures. Sure. Uh, what are some things you've uncovered when it comes to our past? Well, looking way back, I mean, there's a, uh, you know, like something like 11,000 years ago, there's a painting, a cave painting in France known as the Birdman of Lascaux, which was painted in a, you know, the famous Lascaux caves. And it doesn't have wings, but it's basically a man-like figure with a, with a bird's head. So that illustrates that even as far back as 11,000 years ago, our ancestors were you know, conceiving these kind of man-bird hybrids. Um, more recently, but not a lot more recently, you had like uh, the ancient Assyrians, um, Pazuzu, the winged demon, which was kind of like a dog-headed winged humanoid figure. The ancient Sumerians uh, had the Apkalu or Abgal, which were like kind of like winged god-like figures. 
Um, and then, you know, ancient Greece, the harpies. Yeah. Um, you know, you have the, the famous story in the in the Old Testament of Ezekiel seeing this giant ship come, the Merkabah. Oh, yeah. And these four-winged creatures, like he called them the Chaot, came out. And so, I mean, you know, there are all of these references all over the world dating back hundreds and thousands of years of kind of Mothman figures, if you will, winged humanoid, flying humanoid types of creatures. So. Sure, that's really interesting. So some of the sightings we look at, and again, this is a distinction between just regular cryptozoology and then some of the things that we're finding more on the fringes of, yeah. of these subjects where they're not anatomically uh, similar to other animals. They're something that's almost so bizarre and different that we don't have a conventional explanation. So what is it like to find out reports that deal with things like Mothman where you find that there are you know these sightings where they're not flapping their wings, they're just ascending or they're hovering, obvious things that normal creatures can't do. What has that been like in your research? Well, they're defying physics. I mean, you hit on a key point. So for example, the Mothman, typically described as standing like six and a half feet tall, sturdy man-like legs, but a wingspan only 10 feet across. So that doesn't add up. If it were six and a half feet tall, its wingspan would have to be like 20 feet across sure. to you know, physically be able to lift it up in the air. Yeah. Moreover, people describe the Mothman as not flapping its wings ever. As you described, it would just shoot up off the air with no inertia and, just, and then travel 100 miles an hour without flapping its wings. So all of these descriptions, they, they just defy the laws of physics, which is another reason that you would assume that maybe we're dealing not with something flesh and blood or physical, but something... You know, and people have different ways of interpreting this. Supernatural, demonic, extraterrestrial, interdimensional, all of those things could mean kind of the same thing. It's just not of this earth. You know? Sure. So it's still very ambiguous, but we could tell they, they don't really fall into alignment with known creatures that possess these qualities. Nothing that we've seen so far can just spring up into the sky without any kind of uh, propulsion or you're flapping their wings or anything that we can tell. And not only that, but I mean, consider all vertebrates have how many limbs? Well, you've got the four limbs, and two of them, if they've got wings, like you said, have to compensate for the rest of their body. Well, so. with the flying humanoids, people describe wings and arms and legs. Oh, okay, So that's yeah. six limbs. Yeah, that's different. So that <laughs> defies all of the rule. I mean, you have invertebrates, <laughs> you know, with six and eight limbs. But, sure. But the higher vertebrates, tetrapods, for however many hundreds of millions of years, uh, since the Silurian, or, you know, maybe more recently than that. But, you know, basically the first fish and you know tetrapods everything yeah. had four limbs so you know that's another example plus there's the the whole thing about the the eyes and particularly with the mothman people yeah. always describe these flying humanoids as having these giant red glowing eyes self-illuminated eyes and many of the mothman eyewitnesses actually described that these eyes were so mesmerizing that it actually put them in this kind of hypnotic state you know, yeah. where they were just transfixed and they couldn't move or do anything so that that seems kind of supernatural too right? so it's not just the wings you have features about the eyes that don't seem to again line up with any known creatures that have this ability to not just I mean some creatures can reflect that light and you see it when you shine yeah. a light or something nocturnal animals and things have but that when so. you're in total darkness and then you see these two red objects gleaming you know and staring peering into you I think that's a little different and that can be frightening for people there, and very much, and you know, to make a point on that, the animals that do have kind of reflective eyes that are nocturnal, it's usually like a yellow or a green reflection. There's no, there's no animal that I'm familiar with that has red reflective eyes. Sure, you know, that's kind of a weird thing too. So. It, you know, and and one of the things is is that we see some of these and, and the things that you've written about, kind of they they go into this spectrum of creature, person maybe a little bit of both or maybe something different altogether and we come across something uh here closer to the houston area which is known as the houston batman, houston batman. we've written about this and this it doesn't seem to necessarily be a creature so much or you know, maybe it's hard to tell but what has that been like to go through and see um you know, digging into this historic case, because it's like 65 years old, I think now, 66. Sounds right, yeah. And uh, this is not a conventional creature type story, but it's still... And not really a well-known story unless you're into Mothman and, you know, particularly like read the books of John Keel and, you know, he kind of documented it. But uh, June of 1953, there were three people sitting out on a patio in Houston, Texas. This was late at night. 
and they claim they saw this shadowy figure kind of just, you know, land in a, on the branch of a large tree. And they had a tough time kind of making it out at first, but what they described was basically like a man-like figure with bat-like wings folded against his back, but they said that it looked, you know, like it was dressed in some kind of uniform. Like they described it as a paratrooper uniform with a helmet and boots yeah. and, you know, kind of, and hey, it was also glowing, kind of a dull yellowish gray glow. And they watched this figure kind of rocking back and forth for a few minutes, and then the light kind of began to dim, and he almost like vanished. And then, uh, so the story goes that right after that, there was some type of object that shot into the sky from across the street, you know, like a torpedo. Uh, now, one woman who was there, uh, Judith Myers was, I'm sorry, Hilda Walker, was the, the person who contacted the Houston police. So that's how freaked out she was. Yeah, wow. And that made, of course, the Houston Chronicle newspaper. And so that's why it was a well-documented case because it made the newspaper. Um, so they associated it with UFOs because of the object and the glowing in the uniform type aspect. So Yeah, so this kind of does fall into the UFO category somewhat. Again, people generally like to think flying saucers and things like that. But when you have something up there in the sky and you can't tell what it is, even if it's a humanoid in shape, you can say, well, that we can get an idea that there's someone up there. Mm -hmm. Are they human? Are they some kind of hybrid creature? Are they ET or alien? Um, and those are all just speculations until we can really get our hands on something that's out there. Um, you know, we've, we've got it all to look into. You, you also mentioned about the, the bat squatch. So that mm. sounds pretty bizarre that's for some people. That's a weird people. story. What yeah. is that like? Bat squatch was reported in 1994. There was a young guy named Brian Canfield, and he was driving home uh, near uh, Tacoma, Washington, near Mount Rainier, which incidentally is where Kenneth Arnold had the first flying disc sightings back in 1947, right, the pilot. Um, but according to this gentleman, the name Sasquatch, or Bat Squatch, is obviously an homage to Sasquatch because there are a lot of Sasquatch sightings in that area too. Yeah. Uh, but this guy, Brian Canfield, claimed he was driving down this remote road at night, mountain road, and suddenly the engine on his car died, and he just got this weird, like, unearthly feeling, and then this thing descended from the air in front of his car, and he described it as standing like nine feet tall, Sasquatch size, but it had a head like a wolf, bat-like wings, and kind of blue hair. Blue fur hair and yellow crescent-shaped eyes, so really just not of this earth. He said he wasn't really scared, but he just felt like it was really out of place and out of context. Um, and then after a few minutes, this thing took off back into the air and his car miraculously started back up and he drove home. And at, at that point, he was in hysterics. So when he got home, his parents could tell that he had had a really, you know, bizarre experience, and they contacted the police. And the police did apparently did a thorough investigation. They found that he was a very, you know, his reputation was, you know, pretty solid. He didn't do drugs or drink. He, was, he didn't party. He was just kind of a stand-up kid. So um, it's a, kind of a famous story. Not a lot of, uh, there aren't any corroborating sightings. Uh, interesting side note here. Um, Apparently, Brian Canfield's mother recently contacted Nick Redfern because he was writing about it, and she she claims that there there are other elements to the story that maybe haven't ever been discussed. So I'd be interested to find out like what other oh well, yeah, you know, yeah <laughs> residual I mean, things happened after that. But. It's something that you know we don't like. You said we don't have any other cooperating accounts, and this is a fantastic experience that this guy had of something that's you know it's it's one thing to for people to see something like bigfoot i mean that's pretty extraordinary but to see something like that with wings and all these features it's just like you know that's even that more outlandish and so it's pretty incredible Mind that people could be experiencing this and then how do we put that you know into context with anything else we have when there isn't really anything so it's it's interesting to see you've compiled a lot of this great information here in your work encounters with flying humanoids so I'm, I'm imagining that you get a lot of more reports after you write a lot of these books people come and they contact you if they have an experience if they have an encounter mm -hmm. how can they get a hold of you to let you know um, my email address is published on my Facebook fan page so if people go to my Ken Gerhard cryptozoologist on Facebook they can actually find my email address and email me um, there's also my website, KenGerhard.com. My emails admittedly don't always work from that particular site, but um, 
you know, find my email address. It's not that hard to find and email me, reach out to me. And I'd, you know, I'd love to hear about any experiences that are, you know, along that vein. And, yeah. you know, just to, to reassure people, as, as weird as all this stuff sounds, I mean, I've interviewed dozens of people, very credible people that have had these kind of experiences with these flying humanoid creatures. And I can't really, I, you know, I don't have a solid explanation as to what they are, but it is a, a valid phenomenon that people experience. And it's a, obviously a life-changing experience when people have these encounters. So, Absolutely. Well, it's good weird. for you to be able to offer that support in a way that most people would feel uh, like they need to suppress this type of experience because how can they share it when they're just going to be ridiculed sure. all o over the place. So in closing, for those who think that a lot of these sightings are just hoaxes or made up or they just think it's all silly nonsense anyways. What do you say to people with that kind of mindset? Well, I mean, you know, we have to keep things in context in terms of, you know, our true understanding of the universe and the world that we live in. I mean, you know, it wasn't that long ago that people didn't think we'd ever make it to the moon or people thought the earth was flat or, you know, the, the, the process of, of discovery is an ongoing condition of the human experience and I think that it's easy to lose sight of that in this modern day and age when we have all this amazing technology and you know mobile phones and all that kind of stuff computers um, but there's really a lot that we don't know about the the real workings the gears and things of our of our world and our universe and so I think you know we have to keep that in perspective that there are absolutely things beyond our can our, our realm of understanding out there and you know I think if people are just open-minded enough to accept that that you know we don't know everything and that you know there are there are experiences still that we can learn from and you know gain knowledge about absolutely and uh, you know there's so much out there that's still waiting to be discovered um, new things are being discovered every day it seems mm -hmm. the way I see it we won't know if we don't go so. And, e and even in, and not this is not that I pretend, pretend to be a physicist, but you know, in fields like quantum physics, where there, you know, there are theoretical, there's a foundation for a, a multi-universe type thing, where there are other dimensions and realities that maybe we can't comprehend with our limited senses. Sure, things going on around us all the time. So it's pretty fascinating. So we have to keep an open mind, and if you have an experience, don't feel just so. Uh, afraid to be able to share it that it'll never breach anyone because there are people Ken's doing a great job of compiling these accounts and finding the patterns seeing what we can look into getting the information together so if you guys are having anything like this happen be sure to get hold of Ken here and we'll be uh, you know, getting some of that material to you so Ken thanks for your time here Thank today you, Daniel always a pleasure talking to you yeah and we'll look forward to your new work coming here soon If you liked this video, be sure to check out our other content and get connected on our page and social media sites. Every day, new discoveries are being made all across the world and beyond, so let's work together to find out what's next. And remember, we won't know if we don't go. I'll see you in the Vortex.